The evaluations of the comatose patients require a stepwise approach, starting with the history, physical examination, and laboratory evaluation. The causes of the coma may be reversible when detected early. It therefore seems pertinent that once we confirm an unobstructed airways that the patient is breathing and that there is normal circulatory function, a swift and a comprehensive examination must be undertaken. The examiner should determine where is the lesion responsible for the coma, the nature of the coma and what is the urgent steps needed at the time to prevent neurological damage. In neurological examination of comatose patient, the outline is as follows. The examiner must have a systematic and thorough examination. The general examination starts with observing the stationary position of patient on the bed and the attitude of the limb. It should be documented if any spontaneous motor behavior or semi-purposeful movement of all four extremities, the breathing pattern and the oropharyngeal reflexes such as coughing, swallowing, hiccuping or yawning. Inspection for clues for trauma such as bleeding, scars, any track marks and post-operative drainage catheters may indicate the site of the injury. In intensive care environment, all connected intravenous infusion is checked for sedative agents and if the patient is on any vasopressors. This is important if there is a question as to whether a drug or intervention has been causing the effect. For the level of consciousness, the current recommendation by the European Academy of Neurology is that the full outline of unresponsiveness or the full score be used to assess the level of consciousness instead of the Glasgow Coma Scale, which is the GCS score. For the level of consciousness, the examiner must document what the patient did in response to particular stimuli. The stimuli are either peripheral or central. Apply pressure with a pen or pencil to the lateral outer aspect of the proximal or distal interphalangeal joint for 10 to 15 seconds to elicit a response. Take hold of about 2 inches of the muscle located at the angle where the neck and shoulder meet. Then, twist and gradually apply increasing pressure for 10 to 20 seconds to elicit a response. Place the flat of the thumb on the supraorbital ridge. Then, gradually apply an increasing pressure for 10 to 20 seconds to elicit a response. Place the flat of the thumb on both condyles at the level of temporomandibular joint. Then, gradually apply an increasing pressure for 10 to 20 seconds to elicit a response. In neurological condition causing irritation to meninges, such as meningitis and subarachnoid hemorrhage, a bedside diagnostic sign can be used for evaluation. The presence of meningeal irritation, however, is not a phatognomonic for meningitis. Sign that can be included. An attempt is made to flex patient's neck towards the chest. The inability to either touch the chin to the chest or lift the head 8 cm off the bed when supine is used for definition. Two-stage attempt is performed with flexing of lower limb simultaneously at the hip and knee, then extending the knee. Positive test is when there is resistance to the test and or involuntary flexion of the opposite hip. An attempt is made to flex patient's neck towards the chest. Positive test is when the patient involuntarily flexes their hips and knees in an attempt to minimize the meningeal irritation. Next, we move to cranial nerve examination. Only some of the cranial nerves can be tested in patients who are unconscious. These are tested by stimulating a sensory nerve and watching for a reflex motor response. Because of their arrangement along the brainstem, most of the brainstem reflex tests involve testing cranial nerve function. We will show you some examples. Assessment of vision includes voluntary eye movement, visual pursuit and blink to track techniques. The test is done by passively open the eyes of patient without stimulation to trigger the eye opening. Then, look for spontaneous eye movement or eye movement on command. The test is done using a bedside tool such as a mirror. 
put a mirror in front of patient's face to evoke a response and move it horizontally and vertically. Observe for any evidence of visual tracking. The test is done by passively open the eyes of patient, then move your fingers rapidly towards the patient's eyes to see if a blink occurs. This test is done in all four directions. The pupillary assessment and light reflex for cranial nerve number 2 and 3 includes the position of the pupils and the pupillary response. The examiner should notice the shape and position of the pupils, whether it is central, deviated or disconjugate gaze. The pupillary light reflex is simply the change in pupil size that occurs after a light stimulus. It provides information on brainstem integrity in comatose patients. The pupillary assessment should include the shape and the position of the pupils, respond to the light for direct, consensual and relative afferent pupillary defect. This followed by ophthalmoscopic exam to look for evidence of papilloedema that may suggest a raised intracranial pressure. While standing at the head of the patient's bed, elevates both eyelids and release them simultaneously. The lid of the hemiplegic site closes slowly because of flaccidity of its orbicularis oculi muscle. Prior to the test, ensure that the cervical spine is cleared. The head is briefly turned from side to side with the head held briefly at the end of each turn. The degree of rotation must be more than 30 degrees per second in order to generate enough velocity to overcome pursuit. With loss of brainstem reflex, the eye remains in fixed position. The stimulus is applied from the side, gently touching the cornea with a wisp of moisture cotton. Positive results will elicit bilateral blinking of eyes. Caloric testing is a test of the vestibular ocular reflex. The head is elevated to 30 degrees above horizontal so that the lateral semicircular canal is vertical. Check that the tympanum is intact and that the external ear canal is clear. Introduce 50 ml of water into the external ear canal through a small catheter at a temperature of 7 degrees above or below the normal body temperature. Flush at a rate of 10 ml per minute. Allow 5 minutes between testing ears to allow re-equilibration of the oculovestibular system. Attach the pentosh to the tongue depressor. Then, inspect for asymmetry of uvula and palatal arch. With another hand, touch one tonsilla pillar and then the other with cotton tip applicator. Observe for any evidence of gag reflex. For the motor assessment, the neurological assessment may be limited, particularly when the patient is unable to follow steps command or responding to sensory examination. However, the examiner can still be able to perform certain maneuvers and elicit some signs. The motor assessment is divided into The assessment for tone are performed for the upper limb, the lower limb and also for the neck examination. Hold the wrist with your left hand. Then, attempt to dorsiflexion and plantar flexion the wrist with the other. Next, support the patient's elbow. Then, hold patient's hand as if shaking hands and attempt to rapidly supinate and pronate the arm. Next, while still supporting the elbow, passively flex and extend the elbow. This followed by shoulder rotation. Use the same technique on each arm. Place your hand on the thigh and roll the whole legs. If tone is normal, the range of movement of the foot is similar to the rotation of the leg. Then, grasp each leg at the knee and gently lifting it from the bed. Observe the difference between each leg. Then, place your left hand under the patient's thigh while holding the foot with the other hand, alternately extending and flexing the patient's knee and ankle. Gently grasping the head with two hands and move it back and forth and side to side. Another method is called head dropping test for rigidity. Briskly raises the head and allows it to drop. 
for further assessment of the motor response for the movement with elimination of gravity the head end of the bed is placed in 10 degree position the arms and the legs are put in neutral position and the examiner should observe for any evidence of weakness the flaccid arm will be in extension with semi-flex fingers while the leg will be in extension and externally rotated each muscle strength is tested and graded using the Medical Research Council MRC grading. Put patient's arm over the head and drops the weak arm. The hemiplegic arm drops limpy, whereas the normal arm glides or floats down. This is also useful to test for psychogenic neurologic deficits, whereby in organic paresis, the arm hits the face. However, in functional paresis, a voluntary movement allows avoiding the face. Lift patient's leg to 45 degree angle. Then, release the leg and observe a downward movement of the leg. Then, crook the patient's knee on your arm. Extend the knee and drop it. One should observe the difference when comparing the examination on each side. In a hemiplegic leg, the leg will drop more rapidly to strike the bed. To assess the power, patient's thigh is flexed with knee flex at 90 degree. The ability of the patient to maintain a fixed posture of lower limb for a 3 to 5 seconds regarded as power 3 out of 5. For the reflexes, the reflexes are divided into four categories. That includes the deep tendon reflex, the clonus, the cutaneous reflexes and the frontal loop release phenomena. We will show you some examples on how the tests are done. Place an index finger over the middle of patient's chin, holding the mouth open about midway with the jaw relaxed. Then tap the finger with the reflex hammer. The patient's hand is in supination, resting on a solid surface with the fingers slightly flexed. The examiner places her fingers against the patient's fingers and taps the back of examiner's own fingers lightly. The patient's hand is held with the wrist dorsiflexed and fingers dorsiflexed. Snaps the nail of the patient's middle finger. The examiner holds the patient's partially extended middle finger, letting the hand dangle. Then, with the other hand, thumbs or flicks the finger pad upwards. Clonus is a series of rhythmic involuntary muscular contractions induced by the sudden passive stretching of a muscle or tendon. Grasp the patient's patella between the index finger and thumb. Then execute a sudden sharp downward thrust holding downward pressure at the end of movement. Position the patient with the knee flex and the hip externally rotated. The foot should be slightly everted. Then quickly dorsiflexes the foot while maintaining slight pressure on the sole at the end of the movement. Before the examination, the abdomen should be exposed from T5 to L1. This indicates the Ziphi sternum. Umbilicus lies approximately at the level of T9 to T10, the bilateral iliac crest, and the symphysis pubis. First, start at the epigastric area and stroke towards the umbilicus, that's T5 to T7. From upper right quadrant, scratch towards the umbilicus, that's T7 to T9. From lateral to umbilicus, watch for contraction of the abdominal muscles. Lastly, from inguinal region, scratch towards the umbilicus, 
that's approximately T10 to L1. For frontal lobe release phenomena, these phenomena are generally demonstrable in patients with widespread, non-localized bilateral hemispheric lesions. There is examination that requires the patient to be conscious, such as the glabella tap or myosin sign. In this scenario, we still be able to elicit some reflexes. For assessment of the plantar response, in normal individual, stimulation of the skin of the plantar surface of the foot is followed by plantar flexion of the toes. In disease of corticospinal system, there may be a dorsiflexion of the toes with or without fanning of lateral four toes. The best position is in supine, with hips and knees in extension and heels resting on the bed. The response may be reinforced by rotating the patient's head to the opposite side. There are many ways to elicit plantar response. The most commonly looked for is the Babinski sign. We will show you some examples on how the tests are performed. Response may be reinforced by rotating patient's head to the opposite side. Move a blunt object over the heel of lateral aspect of the sole towards the base of great toes. 